We are back into our P-Set uh, 5 solutions. So I'm going to do orange this time. So we have a polymer beam under vacuum seal. Length of polymer is 3 millimeters. To remove the vacuum seal, two pins push the polymer off of the seal. Draw the free body diagram. Draw the shear and bending moment diagrams. Where does the bending moment maximize? Where is the stress uh, maximized as well? Plot the bending stress across the length of the beam. So let's go ahead and tackle these one at a time. So I've got basically a force in the one here. This is my coordinate system, x, y, positive moment as such. So I can draw this. I have a force here. I have a distributed load, Q, which we're going to show as atmospheric temperature. So 1 atm is equal to 101.325 pascals, which is newton meter squared. So we're going to distribute that load. Everything here is going to be per unit depth of the beam. So we'll work on that a little bit later. But let's go ahead and do our free body diagram. So my sum of my forces in the y direction must be equal to F1 plus F2. That length of the beam is distributed over basically a length uh, L over 3. So it's going to be minus Q uh, minus Q times L over 3. Some of my moments about the 1, so I'm going to put it right here. So it's going to be equal to 0. So I'm going to have a minus Q L over 3. And that is basically for this distance here is just going to be L over 2 minus L over 6. And then plus, because I'm going to go counterclockwise, F2, which is applied at um, some distance here, L so from here to here, it's 4L over 6. So I can use this information now, and I'm going to plug in Mathematica. I'm going to do actually a new notebook. Let's close this up. Don't save, because I don't need that. Probably should start saving these, but uh, I'm going to quit my kernel locally here. Excellent. And so now let's go ahead and let's start solving these equations to solve. I want basically here my F1 plus F2 minus Q times L divided by 3 and uh, set that equal to 0. And I want to have my moment, which is going to be minus Q times L divided by 3 times L divided by 2 minus L divided by 6 plus F2, I believe. Yep, times 4 times L divided by 6. Let's solve this for F1 and F2. Doo, doo, doo. It's thinking, it's thinking, it's thinking. Thinking, thinking, thinking. Here we go, here we go, here we go. Oops, does not like it. Why? Because I didn't set that other expression equal to 0. And now it likes it. So we've got our forces. So I'm going to go ahead and just define that right now so we don't have to worry about that anymore. Equals that. Let's set that. Fantastic. So now I can kind of continue on with this problem. So before, if I'm trying to draw the shear and bending moment diagrams from here to here, basically before I reach my F1, my V is equal to zero and my moment is equal to zero. Again, that's just hopefully somewhat uh, trivial. Afterwards, so let's do a cut right after we hit here. So if I look at my beam, basically if you do this kind of first cut, so that's my first cut before F1, and my second cut is gonna be after F1. So my second cut after is gonna look like this, where I have some shear, V, some moment, and then I'm gonna have some point force F1 here. So I could do my sum of my forces in the y direction is equal to 0, which is equal to minus V plus F1. So you will get that V2 is equal to F1. And you can also find that the sum of my moments, let's take the sum of my moments about, uh, for example, let's take it about, actually, yeah, let's take it about this point right here. So if I take that sum of the moments about this point 1, sum equal to 0. If I look at here, I've got an m, and then uh, I'm going to look at this distance. So positive moment minus my v, and then where is v applied from here to here? It is going to be essentially 
some distance x away. So if this total distance here is x, and then this distance I know is l over 6, so it's x minus l over 6. So there we go. So my moment, m2, is going to be equal to v, which is just f sub 1 times x minus l over 6. Fantastic. And I'm going to do my third cut, which is going to be basically right when we get into here, or basically up until l over 2. I have now a distributed load there. So if I look at my third cut here, okay, let's move a little bit further. Let's move this along just a little bit. So now I have a scenario as such. So still have the V, have the moment. I still have my F sub 1. And then now I'm starting to have this distributed load, you know, Q. So I'm going to do the same thing. Set sum of my force to the Y equal to 0. That's going to be equal to F sub 1 minus V, and then it's going to also be minus Q times X minus uh, basically L over 3. And why is it Q X minus 3? Well, we could see that, uh, that our load is being applied, so our full length is X, so basically we have no load until we hit this L over 3. Again, if we're looking back at here, we see that up until L over 3, we're not involved, and then finally we start to apply that load. So at exactly x equals L over 3, we don't have, basically our force would be 0. So we've got that, and so now we can do the sum of the moments equals 0. So let's start at our origin. Let's pick our point right here. So I'm going to have a positive F1 times, apply that load at L over 6, that distance. Then we have a positive moment here, a minus v times x there, because it goes around the other way, and then we have a minus q, again, x minus l over 3, that gives me the force, where is it applied? It is going to be applied at x, um, basically this distance x here, plus l over 3, divide that by 2. So we're only looking, you know, again, we're applying this distance at, you know, some value x, plus L over 3, so add it a little bit over L 3, and then we're dividing it basically by 2 right here. So that would be our solution. Uh, so now I could go and set those equations equal to one another, or actually to everything. And actually, let's go ahead and let's delete this. So let's go ahead and solve. And we could finally have those equations. So solve. Let's set uh, F1 minus v minus q times x minus l over 3. Set that equal to 0. And then f1 times l over 6 plus m minus v times x. And then I have minus q times x minus l over 3 applied at x plus l over 3. And then divide that by 2. And then set that equal to 0. And let's solve that for m and b. And we have got our values. So that's going to be our shear. This is going to be our moment. And now we could go ahead and start. Uh, and then again, by symmetry, everything after L over 2, we've got it. So let's go ahead. Um, and actually, we could start to kind of draw those shear and bending moment diagrams. All right, so now let's go ahead and let's take a peek at what the shear and bending moment diagrams are going to look like. So we have, let's go ahead and actually we have this written already here. So let's go ahead and let's call this, I'm going to call this M3. 3 equals this. I'm going to call this my V3. Equation, equation. So we've got those values, we've got this value. So now I can go ahead and I know that my V1, so let's say V1 equals 0, V1 equals 0, M equals M1 equals 0, M uh, V2 equals, V2 equals, where are we at here? V2 equals F1 and M2 m2 is equal to uh, f1 times x minus l divided by 6. So those are all our values. So we also know that q, q is equal to q 
equals 101.325. We know that our uh, length of our beam is what? Let's go search back up here. Three millimeters, so three times 10 to the minus three. We're gonna be doing this all per unit depth. So let's go ahead and visit this, revisit this. So now I could plot um, several different functions. So I could plot, for example, V1 basically applies for X, I'll just say L. Actually, let's, yeah, let's do L. Uh, let's do the length, actually, let's do the length of our beam. X from zero to L divided by six. L divided by six. And so this will be, and we could do the same thing for here, this will be, so this is V1P, V1 plot, and then we'll do this here, V1, actually, M1P is gonna be equal to the same thing. M1P equals M1. And let's copy and paste this. So V2, that holds V2, P, M2P, V2, and that goes from L over six to, uh, L over six to L divided by three. Uh, let's do the same thing here. And then finally, we'll have the threes. And then again, it's just gonna be mirror image after L over two. So L divided by three to L divided by two. And let's go ahead and let's put these all together. Except I'm gonna do here. Let's go ahead. I'm gonna do plot range. I'm gonna go from zero to, again, L over two. For my x-axis, for my y-axis. Uh, let's go ahead and go from, uh, actually, let's go ahead, let's take a peek at, let's, peek, let's take a peek at this plot first. Uh, so let's see if we can show. So now I'm gonna show V1P, V2P, V3P. Again, it goes by the value of your, so let's look at V3P, just on its own. So let's just do 100. From V3, oops, V3, M3. So that, that did not look right. <laughs> so let's change the plot range. Actually, let's look at V3, please. V3. So let's go from, let's just go from zero to 100, for example. So let's do plot range, zero to L over two, and from zero to 100. Squiggly right there. Now let's see if we can find all three. Excellent, so we see zero, then we're climbing up and then climbing back down for the uh, shear moment. Let's look at, let's do the same thing. M1P, M2P, and M3P. Again, we'll we'll stop showing this after a while. Um, let's look at MP3 or M3P from zero to 0 0.038. Uh, let's go ahead and make sure we calculated that correctly. So three millimeters. All right, excellent. Q is 101.3. Yeah, excellent, and so let's go ahead and take a peek at that. So let's go from zero to, let's plot, let's do the plot range here. Plot range, again, no, not plot range, clipping. Plot range, I'm gonna go from zero to L divided by two for my X, and I wanna go from zero to 0 0.05, let's see. So let's do, M3P first, and then M1P. Let's take a peek. Yeah, so what we're looking at here is just half, so just to L over two, but, and if you take the integral, you can actually show the values, but those are your equations, and then just look like a mirror image on the other side. So those are our shear and bending moment diagrams. Now we know that the stress, stress is equal to, uh, basically minus my moment uh, equation, M, 
uh, times my y divided by my moment of inertia. So I could plug in for stress. So for example, I could clearly see that the stress is maximized along the x-axis. Um, so I wouldn't need to take my equation for m3p slash dot m3p um, slash dot m goes to, excuse me, slash dot m goes to m3p slash dot x goes to l over 2. So, oops, not m3p, just m3. So I've got that value. My y value would just be half the length. So I could start to plug that in. But I know that my stress is going to be maximized here because my stress is directly proportional to the values. If I look at this value, my y is positive. So and we can look at kind of the bending that is going on in this problem. So let's go ahead. So if I look at the bending here, I'm going to have curvature like this. So because it's bending, actually, excuse me. Uh, Actually, yeah. Uh, if I look at this, these forces go up, so my material is going to bend like this. Uh, that is positive curvature. We know that, again, the stress is going to be compressive here, so basically negative there, positive on the bottom. And we could look at that, again, this y, this is our y value. So this is our neutral plane y, this is y over 2, you know, or just basically positive plus y here, minus y here. So again, we have tension here on the bottom of the beam, and then compression at the top. So, again, that's essentially how you would solve that problem. So, let's zoom out a little bit, and then let's get on to number two once we kind of do some good old-fashioned erasing. And again, I need the function. Someone in the comment section, please <laughs> tell me how do you erase everything on one note so I don't have to do all this erasing. But it's completely okay, so no worries. So let's look at the following metallic uh, pipe um, where the applied load is 50 newtons, assume the pipe is solid and hollow with a circular diameter of two centimeters. So let's go ahead and let's attack this problem. So let's start this problem by looking at and actually drawing our free body diagram. So let's start at the origin here. So I have this kind of supported area right here. So I'm gonna draw out my free body diagram and let's go ahead and let's kind of get started here. So I'm going to draw also a coordinate system. One, two, three, as usual. And let's go ahead and get started. So at this origin, I am going to have some f, uh, basically x at the origin. It's going to point in this direction. I'm going to have some force right here in the y, or I guess we could call this, just to be consistent with the So three force in the three applied at the origin. And I have, again, some force pointing down in the three directions. So if I do the sum of my forces, uh, not in the y, but in the three, set those equal to zero. That will just be, uh, actually, I could do force in the three direction zero. I could also do some of the forces, not in the two, actually this would be in the two direction. So let's go ahead and redraw this. So force in the two direction at the origin, force in the three direction. So force in the two direction at the origin, which is going to be equal to zero, equals F2, zero. So trivial answer there. If I look at the force in the three direction, I have minus that applied force, which is going to be 50 newtons. And then I'll also have my uh, positive force in the three direction at the origin. So I know that my force in the three at the origin is equal to 50 newtons. So we've got that value right there. Um, now we can also do the sum of the moments as well. So sum of the moments about that point, our origin, is going to be equal to what? There's going to be some some moment, so as we push down here, uh, there's going to be some moment basically going in the opposite direction. So it's going to go, if we're going around here, we're going to have some moment like this. So that is counterclockwise, so some positive moment minus my basically force, which is going to be force in the, if I look at it here, so minus force, because I'm going clockwise, minus force, where are we applying that? Times 20 centimeters. So I can solve for that moment as well. And actually, let's go ahead and do that right now. So I'm going to, once again, I'm going to clear my kernel. Valuation, quick kernel. Yes. So F3 naught is equal to 50 newtons. And then we also have that my, uh, basically, my M, my moment, is going to be equal to F uh, times F3 naught 
times 20 times 10. Actually, let's do this here. 20 times 10 to the minus 2. There we go. So we've got those values. So, got the rebounding iron, found the reaction loads, and now we need to write out the stress state at O. So, when I'm looking at the stresses, I have, let's go ahead and draw our stress tensor. So, we know at this origin point zero, I don't have any stresses in the one one, I don't have any stresses in the two two, or any shear stresses. In fact, I only have, by symmetry I have that, I only have stresses in the 3-3. Three, three. And I only have a couple of applied stresses. So at this origin here, or actually at this, you know, at this origin here, what are we acting upon? So there's some force, basically from here. So there's some negative compression, there's compression there over some unit area, a not. And I have a positive moment. So actually, so if we look at this, if we look right here, if we look at this kind of diagram like this, as I bend here, and that's, so my material is gonna bend like this. So I'm gonna have, at that origin there, this material is expanding. So again, that stress is gonna be, even though our curvature is negative there, we're gonna have positive, basically, value of stress. So plus and bending stress. So if I look and I actually bend this material, I'm going to have positive stress there because why? My material is expanding here that's compressing on the other side. So pos positive my over i. So let's go ahead. So compression, tension, let's add them up. What's my area here? So my area will simply be, uh, again, it's a circular cross section. So uh, circular cross section with a diameter. So my radius is equal to uh, 2 times 10 to the minus 2. So that's my radius. We're solid. So pi r squared is my area. So F3 naught. So actually, let's just sum it up. Minus F3 naught divided by my area, which is pi, pi times r squared, plus my moment, which is m, times my y, which is my y. So my positive y is going to be basically half that. It's going to be my radius because again, half that distance. So again, if I'm looking over here, this would be my kind of y direction. So that's my y. So moment times the radius divided by my moment inertia. What's my moment inertia for a solid uh, cylinder? It is just gonna be equal to pi times r to the fourth, and then all that divided by four. So divide that by moment inertia. Let's look at that numerically. That's my value of stress. Excellent. Number two is down. So let's go ahead and let's move on to number three. So we're looking at a ceramic uh, cantilever beam um, with length. And now we're told the load is applied. Um, what is the deflection at the end of the beam? What about halfway along the length? What about fixed? So again, before we ever start, let's just go ahead and start to draw our free body diagram for this problem. So we have got... Let's erase here. Let's get number three out of the way. Two, 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 two. All right. So I've got my free body diagram here. So I can already see there's going to be some, uh, basically, if we push up here, there's going to be some force, reaction force. Uh, if I do my x, y positive, some reaction force in the y at the origin. There's going to be some force in the x about the origin. Um, and there's also gonna be some moment as we kind of go around here, there's gonna be some moment that looks like this. So, as I do the sum of my forces in the x equals zero equals basically my fx at the origin, sum of my forces in the y is gonna be equal to p uh, minus fy at the origin, set that equal to zero. So I know that my fy at the origin is equal to uh, p, so we've got that. And I know that some of the forces, or some of the moments, about our origin. Let's just put it right here. Sum will equal to zero. So that will be equal to uh, basically minus m plus p times l. So our m is equal to pl. Excellent. Now we can do our cuts. So if I do my first cut right here along this one, 
So one cut. So I'm gonna be left with a, basically a diagram that looks like this. We have a V, we have a moment, we have basically this minus Fy at the origin, and we also have a moment going around here. That moment is PL. So if I do my sum of my moments, uh, and actually we could just do the sum of the moments about the origin, that's gonna be equal to minus uh, basically V times X, so this little x element here. So some of the moments is going to be minus vx. Actually, let's do some of the moments first. Let's do some of the forces on y. Set those equal to zero. So what are our moments? Uh, we are going to be left with minus v, and then basically minus uh, p, which is this force right here. So we are going to see that v is equal to minus p. So that is our shear diagram. And for our moments, minus Vx, like we said, plus our moment, minus that moment PL. So we have our equation that M is gonna be equal to, uh, we could kind of put that on around here. So M is gonna be equal to, set this equal to zero, M equals Vx uh, plus PL. But we also know that M, V is equal to minus P. So minus P times minus Px plus p out. So, now, oops, wrong, uh, wrong value here. So we are also asked about deflections. So we can use our expression that the deflection del squared v dx squared equals m over e i. Um, and so now we could go ahead and solve for those values. Now, what are our boundary conditions here in this problem? Well, we're gonna say that the deflection at x equals zero is gonna be zero, and if we take the derivative of that displacement at value at x equals zero, it's gonna also be equal to zero. So let's go ahead, let's clear all our values. Evaluation, quick kernel, yada, yada, yada. Let's let it kind of reset here so that we can go ahead and solve through this problem. So let's go at it right now. So I am going to go ahead and set my uh, m is equal to, actually, do we want to set the m right now? I actually think so. So let's go ahead and set our m. Let's just set our m sub 1 is equal to minus p times x plus p plus p times l. So let's leave that here. So let's do our V double prime. Let's do D solve. D solve, uh, basically, uh, V double prime of X. Uh, set this equal to M divided by our Young's modulus Y. I'm gonna leave this times mo my, moment of inertia. Uh, and, excellent. So that's our equation. So but we also have some boundary conditions. So I need to have basically my boundary conditions, V of zero set equal to zero, V prime of zero set that equal to zero. And then we wanna solve for basically V as a function of X, that's our variable. Let's do D solve and let's actually substitute in M1 here. Excellent. So. Now, we can kind of proceed towards actually solving for the rest of this problem. So let's go ahead and start to solve this problem and let's see what the actual question is asking us as well. So that would be a good start. So this is our function, this is our V function. So let's set that equal. We also know for this function that, let's, let's start to plug in some values here. So let's go over here. Let's get us a little bit over here. Let's just move this over. All right. so. We have a beam that has a length, L, is equal to 200 times 10 to the minus 6. We have a width, which is equal to 30 micrometers. Um, we also know it's a ceramic beam, so I know that my Young's modulus is equal to 300 times 10 to the 9. So let me pull up some other values here. Excellent. Um, we know that our moment of inertia, mom i, is going to be equal to 1 divided by 12 because we have a rectangular beam now, thankfully. 
Um, and then we know it's going to be our base times height. So we're going to have, well, let's see here, 30 times 10 to the minus 6. And then we're going to do by our thickness. It's going to be 0 0.9 times 10 to the minus 6. Again, this should be, hopefully, recall um, from other values here. So moment of inertia, this, this, this. Excellent. So we'll define those values. And now we actually have, also have the load, excuse me. Um, so I apply, actually, let's not define the load. But I've got these values here. So v slash dot, uh, my p slash dot p goes to, uh, what is the load? 0 0.1 micronewton. 10 to the minus 6, and we are asked for what is the deflection at the end of the beam. So let's do x slash dot, or actually x goes to at the end of the beam. So let's look at, oh, there we go. What about, I think it's at what is the end of the beam, what about halfway along the length? So the deflection here would just be L over 2. And then what about at the fixed base? That better be zero, but let's just confirm, and everyone's happy. Excellent. So we've got the free body diagram. We do that. Uh, we looked at the bending moment. When is when is bending maximized? Um, so let's see. We've got the equations for the shear diagram. We got the equations for the bending moment. Um, uh, where is the bending moment maximized? So let's look at our M equation. So let's look at M1. So our bending is maximized when my slash dot x goes to L. So, oops, slash dot x goes to zero, excuse me. So that is when our bending moment is maximized. So again, kind of makes sense intuitively, should at least. Uh, what about my shear moment? So my shear, it's constant. So where is stress maximized? Again, our stress is gonna be equal to, stress is equal to minus my over i. So where my bending moment is maximized and my y basically is at the kind of top. So if I look at here, I'm going to have compression at the over here and then tension in the other way in this particular problem. So there we go. And you can kind of see that reflected in those values as well. So we've got it. So now I can look at the rest of this problem. The AFM claims, uh, claims to have a resolution uh, measuring forces of one femtonewton. What deflection does this correspond to? So we can actually go through and calculate that out. So if we do that, I could look at the femtonewton. So V slash dot, again, P goes to 1 times 10 to the minus 15. And we could just look at the displacement at X goes to L. So what would be that displacement? Pretty small displacement. So this would be my displacement here. Um, so very, 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 very small. Uh, very, very less than, you know, obviously much smaller than even an, an atom. So very, very small displacement deflections, especially at the maximum deflection. So very, very small. All right, I want to use this beam to actually cause the buckling of a polymer, nanocolumn, with a 400 nanometer diameter, and one micrometer length, um, basically column. Uh, what deflection is required to cause buckling? So I am now looking at a different problem. So previously we were causing the uh, kind of moon to go up. So now we're going to make it to go down. So all that I'm going to do is instead of the deflection being positive, I'm just going to kind of flip that, um, flip those values. So let's go ahead and let's solve for uh, these different values. So I could actually pull from my notes uh, those equations, but I tell you what, let's go ahead and let's rederive this problem. So if I look at my equations here, actually we could pull it up. So let's draw, go ahead and just draw it up ourselves. So I've got this, I've got this, I've got my beam, I've got my load P, I've got my reaction force like this, and then I've got my moment. This just goes like this, this is gonna go like this. So if I do, again, I know that this force is equal to P, this moment is equal to, uh, let's do that, moment is equal to PL. So now I'm going to do my sum of my forces. Actually, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take the equation from the notes. So let's go let's save ourselves a little bit of time here. Not that it's not, you know, meaningful to kind of rederive it, but let's go ahead and do this.
Uh, so let's go ahead and let's pull up our notes. Let's go to our lecture eight and let's find that equation that we already have developed. Actually, it's the uploaded media, I believe. Uh, so let's go in class. Actually, let's go ahead and we can derive this. Actually, yeah, let's go to our let's go over here. Let's go to our lecture notes. Let's look at our cantilever beam bending, beams and buckling, and then let's go and let's get these values here. Actually, we've got that's a distributed load. We could do the same thing for our. Actually, we don't want buckling. Excuse me. But here, yes, we could do. So this would be my point load for cantilever beam, P times L minus X, and we can go ahead and get those values. Actually, we can see it and do that on several different uh, equations. So let's go ahead and do that. So we could take this M here, not for our four point bending, but for our, basically, this equation here. So I can go ahead and take, we could redefine M. M is equal to P times L minus X. So we can go ahead and do this value. We could do D solve. Oops. And now it doesn't like it because we have our equation V. Let's do clear, let's clear V. So we have P, we have this. So now I can solve here. This would be my equation. So this is my V compression, V2. Set that equal here. And I can now figure out the rest of this problem. So let's go back. So you can rederive it. You can just use that expression, but um, we want to now cause the buckling of a polymer. So we first have to do what is my moment of inertia of this column. So my I mom or my I column is going to be equal to what again? It's going to be equal to pi times. I'm going to call this. What's my radius for this problem? Radius equals 200 nanometers. So 200 nanometers is my radius. I'm going to do this pi r to the fourth divided by four. That's my moment of inertia of my column. And now I am going to continue to work on this problem. So got my moment of inertia. And we know our expression from our beam buckling expression. What is the relationship between the critical load applied and our moment of inertia? So if we remember, we found that for buckling, so my P crit is equal to what? It's gonna be pi times my moment or it was modulus I E, excuse me, over my moment of inertia and L squared. So I need to figure out what is gonna be my critical load. So all I'm gonna do is just do pi times what is this type of beam? Um, I want to use a polymer nanocolumn. So my Young's modulus for my polymer, again, this is the deflection of my polymer beam buckling. So one times 10 to the ninth, that's my Young's modulus here, times my IC uh, divided by, what is my length in this problem? One micrometer, so one times 10 to the minus six. So I need to solve, actually just find this value. So let's look at this numerically but I need to make sure this is squared. That would have been a problem. So that is my P critical. So I'm gonna go ahead and just put that in. P crit equals this. So that's the critical load that is gonna cause buckling. So I need to apply that load to this column here. So what deflection of my cantilever beam does that apply to? Well, I'm just gonna do V2 slash dot. Uh, I'm gonna do P goes to p crit and then uh my x i want to do that's the length of my beam let's just make sure that the length is still the length <laughs> um so let's look at this numerically uh the length of my beam is still or my 
What's the length of my cantilever beam? Uh, length of 200 micrometers. Yep, that looks pretty right. So 200 micrometers is, yeah, that looks fine. Good, let's just rederive and make sure we're, we've got that there. We've got that here. So let's go ahead and look at that deflection. And as you can see, that's a pretty significant deflection to, in order to uh, you know bend that beam. So, uh, but that's our value. So we've got it. So that one is done. So now let's look at this complex metallic beam bending scenario below. So let's go ahead and erase and let's go ahead and get into this metallic beam bending scenario with two distributed loads and one that is not quite as straightforward, but hopefully you remember your geometry and your triangles and all that good stuff. All right, I'll see you in the next problem. All right, so let's go ahead and start this problem. So we have these two distributed loads. We're asked for, again, bending moment maximized, plotting bending stress. So let's go ahead and draw our free body diagram. So we know that we are gonna have some force, let's call this area, uh, let's just call this area two in the y direction, some force in the two in the x direction. There's gonna be some force in the one in the y direction, again, x, y, positive coordinate system. And we have some of these distributed loads, um, but I could model this as a free body diagram as such. So I could replace this as just q1 dot times 50 millimeters. And here I can plot this as a point force as well, q2 dot 60 millimeters over two, this is applied at zero point, basically in the half here. This is applied at two thirds. So the actual equation for this line will be Q equals Q2 times one minus X over 60 millimeters. So that's our expression here for basically our Q2. So I can go ahead and now do, let's do some of the forces in X equals zero equals F of my two in the X. Some of my forces in the Y are gonna be equal to F1 plus F2 uh, minus Q1 dot 50 millimeters minus Q2 dot 60 millimeters over two. And my sum of my moments along basically A here, sum of my moments in A, I'm gonna set that equal to zero. Uh, and then this is gonna be equal to minus Q1 times my 50 millimeters, and again, dotted with 25 millimeters, because that's the distance where this is applied. And let's keep going. I'm going to erase over here. Let's actually zoom out a little bit. Um, actually, let's go ahead and erase. Erase all this stuff over here. Minus 25, or uh, times 25 mil, uh, millimeters, mm, plus my F2, which is applied at what? 120 millimeters, because again, that's gonna give me that counterclockwise rotation, minus Q, Q, excuse me, minus Q2 dot 60 millimeters divided by two times, where is it applied? It's applied at 60 millimeters plus two times 60, so it's applied at, this force is applied at in your triangle area, two thirds along the length of that you know triangle. So two times 60 millimeters over three. There you go. So you can solve for those. Um, and now we can go ahead and start to make our cuts into the system as well. So let's do our first cut. We'll just kind of call this our first cut right here, one. So looking at this diagram, I am gonna have my usual V, my moment. Here I've got my F1, and I have my distributed load here, so going all the way across it, Q1. So if I look at my sum of my forces in my Y, set that equal to F1 minus Q1 times X, the length of the beam, minus V, set that equal to zero. Sum of my moments at my origin here, that's gonna be equal to M, and then minus VX minus Q, times Q1 times X times X over two. So my second cut would come basically in that middle there. So now I'm looking at a diagram that looks like this. So I've got my point force, so minus Q1 dot 50 
millimeters applied at 25 millimeters for my origin, which is F1 right here. I've got my V, I've got my, oops, I've got my moment that's going like this. And I could do, again, sum of the forces and the Y, set that equal to zero, equals F1 minus V minus Q1.50 millimeters. Some of my moments about my origin, which I choose to be here, set that equal to zero, so this can be M minus V, oops, let's go ahead and finish that up, minus V times X, and then minus Q1 dot 50 millimeters, and then it's also dotted by my 25 millimeters here. So that would be it. So I would get those values, and then we should be good to go. The third cut would be into here. So this is my second cut. And my third cut would be into that other distributed load. So for my third cut, this gets a little bit more complicated. I've got my F1, I've got my 25 millimeters, I've got my basically Q1.50 millimeters, my point source, and then now into here, I've got my V, I've got my moment, and I've got my load that's like kind of distributed like this. So when I do the sum of my forces in the Y, I've got my usual suspects, F1, I've got my minus V, I've got my minus Q1.50 millimeters, and now I have my expression that we had way above there, minus Q2 times 1 minus X minus 60 millimeters over 60 millimeters. That's it. What about the sum of my moments at the origin? That's going to be equal to M minus Q1. So I've got my positive, minus Q1 dot my 50 millimeters dot my 25 millimeters, minus my V times my X distance, minus Q2 times, and let's zoom out here a little bit, Q2 times one minus, again, X minus 60 millimeters over 60 millimeters. And where is that point source gonna be applied? It's gonna be at X minus 60 millimeters over times two over three. So again, this is the load. Where is it going to be applied? Eventually, it's going to be at that value there, x minus that 60 millimeters. So those are my moments equations. And now with that, you can go ahead and solve the rest of that problem. So we've got our free body diagram. And now we can, uh, let's see, we've got the free body diagram. We've got the shear and bending moment equations. and then. Yeah, from that, you could find along each moment where that bending moment is maximized. So with that, again, a lot of this is symbolic, so we can't really get the full answers. But again, you can start to kind of plug in values and then see how it would look like. The key part is getting these equations for this problem. So let's go on to our last problem, number five, and let's do some erasing here. Uh, and let's go ahead and erase it, and then eventually we'll get to it. Let's erase, and let's start this last problem or this problem set. Fantastic to get this done. All right, let's go ahead and start our last problem. Now we are at our last problem. So in a biological cell, there are often bundles of filaments. The ECM participate in the cell locomotion. These fibers undergo contraction and often buckle. So basically we have a filament that is uh, basically one micrometer long. So my length is equal to one micrometer. And basically these filaments contract uh, and they could often buckle. So what force will cause a buckling instability? Well, let's quit our kernel as always. And then we know that my equation, whoops, my equation for, nope, I don't want to switch to tablet mode. No, it's okay, everything's all right. P crit is equal to pi times my Young's modulus times I over L squared. And we are gonna assume that we are a solid column. So my I column or my I of a cylinder, essentially, is gonna be pi times R squared uh, divided by four. And actually, we can, I actually think that there is a little bit of a typo here. So let's look at the, let's look at this problem. Let's look at our files. Let's look at our P sets. Uh, actually, let's look at uploaded media. So let's look at our P set six, not our P six six, excuse me, our P set five. I believe that we're given a little bit more information about our the dimensions. 
So the spin, uh, can buckle, span the length of the cell, which is on. So let's go ahead and let's, sorry, let's go to assignments and let's go to piece of five. And let's look at, here we go. This is the one we want to see. Uh, actually, excuse me, a length that's on the order of 50 micrometers. So 50 micrometers and diameter. So the length is equal to 50 micrometers and a diameter, which is equal to two micrometers. So I know that pi r squared, exactly over four. Let's just make sure that we're okay here. My length is gonna be equal to 50 times 10 to the minus six. My diameter or my radius is gonna be equal to one times 10 to the minus six. Let's make sure we're okay there. Diameter, length, fantastic. So I've got my, I have my column. So my P crit, and I am dealing with the biological material. So my Y, my Young's modulus is equal to one times, one times 10 to the nine. And now I can do my P crit, which is just gonna be pi times Y times IC divided by uh, my L squared, which is my divided by L squared. So let's look at this numerically and Let's continue here. So that will be my pre-critical load. So pi, y, all that divided by L squared. Excellent. So that will be my critical load to cause essentially this bucking. Quite, quite, you know, somewhat substantial. Almost, uh, actually not super, it's 986 kPa, so almost 1000 kPa. Uh, actually, yeah, 96 kPa. Um, so what force will cause buckling instability? We've got uh, essentially that critical load. Um, what if this was a thin-walled hollow filament? Well, if this was a thin-walled hollow cylinder, or actually, actually if we could, uh, if we kind of looked at this as a sphere as well. Um, so, if you looked at this, you would have, or you'd find, if this was a sphere, for example, um, I would look uh, for thin-walled. I'd have some expression for my thin-walled over is be equal to r over t, where r is the radius of my, basically, my thin walled. So this would be my r, and the thickness would be here. So if I'm thin walled, my r over t is usually greater than that, so my thin walled moment of inertia is much larger. So this would indicate to me that my thin walled would be, again, larger moment of inertia if I have hollow elements. It's gonna require, it's gonna be much more, basically, it will resist buckling quite a bit more. However, we know that in reality, if I have thin walled materials, they can often kink and fail and buckle axially. So that stress for that type of buckling, so local local buckling or kinking, you've probably seen that on in tubes before, so that's why we don't make everything out of, you know, this equation would uh, assume that we just need a super, super, super large <laughs> inertia, so very, very, very thin. So but the actual stress is just gonna be my own modulus times my thickness over r times square root of three times one minus nu. So you can see, actually, let's go ahead and just plug in some values and play around with it. So you can see if I start to get pretty thin, let's say my r over t ratio, let's, so let's say y times, let's say my r over t ratio was 0 0.1, like t over r, r over t is 10, so let's just say 0.1 for that value. And then we're dividing it by, divided by square root of three times one minus 0 0.4 for a polymer. So you can kind of see that the stresses actually are not too substantial. So again, this would be the stress if I was, again, at a very thin walled you know, material, um, thin walled sphere essentially, that would be essentially my moment of inertia there. Or actually not my moment of inertia, excuse me. Um, this would be the stress to cause buckling. So probably much, 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 much less than would we actually cause. Again, this is the loading, your Newtons, but this is the actual stress. So that's it. Uh, you're done with the problem set. Congratulations. Start problem set six, and you're almost done with the class. Thanks, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.